everyone, and welcome to the Homeland Security Training Institute podcast here from the College of DuPage. I'm your host, Tom Brady, the Associate Dean of the Homeland Security Training Institute and the Public Services Division at the college. And for those of you who have been regular listeners of these podcasts, I want to thank you. And for those of you who may be tuning in for the first time, I'd like to welcome you and also let you know that we do these podcasts on a regular basis, and we bring in experts in the area of Homeland Security. We talk a lot about a lot of different topics, things that are happening right now, uh, ways that you can become safer, and ways to understand what's going on, not only throughout the country, but throughout the world in Homeland Security. And my guest today is Dr. Jenny Hesterman, who is a colonel with the U.S. Air Force Retired. She's an academic author, instructor, and counterterrorism expert. In her 21-year military career, she served in three Pentagon tours and commanded in the field multiple times. Her last assignment was vice commander at Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland, where she led installation security, including the protection of Air Force One, and regularly escorted the president and other heads of state. She's the recipient of the Legion of Merit, the Meritorious Service Medal with five oak leaf clusters, and the Global War on Terrorism Service Medal. After retirement in 2007, she worked as a cleared private contractor in Washington, D.C., investigating terrorist organizations, transnational threats, organized crime, and exploitation of the Internet. Dr. Hesterman recently lived in the Middle East for two years and traveled the region observing security measures and soft target hardening. And it is my pleasure to welcome back Dr. Jenny Hesterman. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me today. Appreciate it. Well, thrilled to have you on the show because, you know, we've, we've worked together over the last few years on our Homeland Security Training Institute Live, which I'm going to talk about. And you, you're, you're obviously an expert in a lot of things related to terrorism, specifically soft target hardening, which I was excited to hear about the second edition of your book, which is called Soft Target Hardening, Protecting People from Attack. And as I understand it, this book was named the American Society of Industrial Security Book of the Year for 2019. First of all, congratulations on that, Jenny. Thank you. Thanks. Talk, talk to me a little bit about the, 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 the new edition of your book and, and what people that are out there could find while reading it. Okay. Uh, well, the first edition was published in 2014, and consider that that was really just five years ago, and ISIS was still contained in Iraq. It had just started spilling over into Syria. And as you said, I was living in the Middle East at the time, and soft targets had been hardened there against possible terrorist attack for many years. If we think about the age of modern terrorism, really was born in the Middle East back in the 1960s with aircraft hijackings and attacks. So they've been hardening targets there for a long time. And I observed physical hardening at places like our daughter's high school, our housing compound, hospitals, malls, and churches. So it came to me when I was there in 2014 that maybe I could capture a little bit about this emerging threat vulnerability and hardening of soft targets and put it onto a book aimed at the U.S. so we could cross-apply some of these techniques and tactics to protect our soft targets and citizens. Now, after the book came out in 2014, ISIS really started to grow in strength. Um, in fall 2015 is when they perpetrated the shocking Paris attacks, and then danger showed up on our doorstep with the ISIS-inspired attack at the Christmas party in San Bernardino. So ISIS was expertly leveraging the Internet to recruit, inspire, and share tactical information, really similar to al-Qaeda, newsletters, and social media. And they started carrying out regular attacks against soft targets worldwide, and things escalated with the Pulse nightclub, the Brussels airport, and metro attacks. And so much was just transpiring with this group, which we initially saw as really just a nuisance more than anything. We never predicted the fast rise of ISIS in just a few years' time or their ability to carry out these large multifaceted attacks in our major cities. So the rise of ISIS was really what we call a black swan event. You know, it wasn't predicted. Mm-hmm. It had vast impact. So after that first book in 2014, I started tracking the rise and spread of ISIS and attacks 
the strengthening of al-Qaeda and its splinters, as we're now seeing, but not just terrorism. Violent crime was rising, especially mass attacks against soft targets like the music festival in Las Vegas and churches and schools. So really, each attack on a soft target hits the reset button on everything from the target selection to the tactics used. So I decided to try and capture the escalation and the emerging threats in this four-year period And my editors, uh, thankfully, agreed that a second edition of the book was a good idea. So that's where it came from. Well, it's a great book. And uh, I think I I mentioned to you not too long ago, I did a a presentation on uh, uh, workplace violence. And after the uh, lecture that I did, one of the students that were in there in the the, the seminar came to me and said that, um, have you asked me, have you read Soft Target Hardening, Protecting People from Attack? Um, that Dr. Jenny Hesterman had written. And I was like, yeah, of course I have. And I said, you know, it's, it's, it's fantastic. So just so you know, there's people out there that, that have read your book that have actually taken some really good security points away uh, from that. And so I know that that's something that was probably your goal when you, when you wrote the second edition. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for um, conveying that story. That really means a lot to me. And my whole goal was just to try to get this information out to people and and really security practitioners, but also just the average citizen, the people who are dealing with this in the workplace, worried about their children at school, concerned about their churches. So I try to write my books um, with what I would call it plain language. Don't use a lot of security jargon. You know, it's for Mm -hmm. everyone to use from the um, decision makers to practitioners to just the average citizen and, and getting that information out um, is a challenge sometimes. So I really appreciate the, to know that people are reading it. Yeah, I mean, it's a great book. And I think that anybody who reads it who's in the field of security or doesn't even, like you said, have to be, they can just be citizens that want to learn of how they can make themselves safer in, in today's world. You know, mm-hmm. Jenny, based upon the fact that Your first book was only written five years ago, and and you have a second edition that just came out. Um, That doesn't bode well for what's going on in the world. And why do you think, in your professional opinion and the research that you've done, why are things continuing to escalate? Because this doesn't seem like it's stopping. Um, It seems like, you know, every few weeks or so, there's another um, event or uh, a mass casualty attack. It just seems that violence has just become common nowadays. In your opinion, why do you feel that is? Oh, that's that's a really hard question. I mean, I guess if we had the answer, we would be able to, to address it. It's so multifaceted. I mean, it's it's rooted in everything from uh, violent video games, I'd say, just the culture, changing the culture. Um, and also, I think, people. So I think that there's an increase in vulnerability. Um, I'm starting to see some behaviors and attitudes forming around the topic of security that adds to our vulnerability. Uh, first of all, it's been 18 years since 9-11. So mm-hmm. people, you know, people are pretty tired about the topic of Al-Qaeda and ISIS and, you know, how we have to take our shoes off at airport security and separate our liquids. And really, if you look at it objectively, a small group of people literally shifted the center of gravity in our country. Um, and I think people have what I, what I would call security fatigue. I think they're just tired of dealing with it. Um, or they've accepted it as our new normal. Um, you know, there'll be, like you said, there's this uh, mass shooting epidemic, right? Called a pandemic in our country. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's going to be at a Walmart or an outdoor cafe or a festival. It's going to happen. We can't prevent it. And thus people maybe are stopped. They're not fighting back. They're stopping the fight against it. They're sort of accepting it, um, which gives them a blind spot and also increases our vulnerability. Yeah, it's really just, you know, uh, disheartening to kind of see what's going on, in not only in our society, but uh, really around the world. The one other thing I want to mention, and it's really, I'm glad that, Jenny, you're on the line here, because we're, we're very excited to have you returning to the College of DuPage to participate in our Homeland Security Training Institute live here at the college on Tuesday, November 12th. It's a free event, and the topic is soft target hardening from theory to practice. Can you talk, Jenny, a little bit about that and what will your involvement in it will be? Sure. So I'll, I'll cover what soft targets are at the beginning so that we have a common definition of, of what we're talking about in terms of 
places where people gather, where they're vulnerable. Maybe security is not a primary mission, um, and it just leaves them vulnerable to attack. So we'll, we'll talk about that. But then what I'm really excited about is to use a tool. Uh, we will use a vulnerability assessment tool that was developed by the FBI following the 9-11 attacks. And the purpose of the tool was to help communities think through their vulnerabilities. So the language is very clear and plain. Um, sometimes what I call security speak causes a lot of confusion with people. And I enjoy using this, this specific tool uh, mm-hmm. when helping schools, churches, hospitals, businesses, and other places, because the questions are very thought-provoking and they're in plain, easy-to-understand language. Um, So it's interesting because when people think of target hardening, they usually think of physical hardening like fences and cameras and bollards, things like that. But really, education about the threat, what is the threat, uh, and assessing the vulnerability are hardening activities. So I'm asking workshop attendees to have an organization or an event in mind. It could be their place of business. It could be a children's school, a church, a Fourth of July event, a parade, something like that. And the tool that we'll use considers the unique characteristics of an organization or an event. It can be tailored to it. So we'll look at um, the function, the general public image, visibility in the community, symbolic value, things like that. Has this organization been targeted before or organizations of this type, not just in the U.S., but somewhere in the world? Because we have to understand that uh, even when something happens far away, like a school attack in Pakistan, for instance, we need to understand that the those perpetrators are the same ones that threaten us here at home and have carried out attacks here at home. So looking around the world at um, organizations and events that have been attacked, The assessment considers who works in the organization um, and what danger they bring in terms of insider threat, uh, and also visitors and people who frequent facilities, what danger they may bring. Now, there's 17 sections on the assessment tool, but not every section applies to the organization or the event, such as um, the storage of dangerous chemicals, for example, like chlorine for pools, something that we would be concerned about in terms of threat or using as a weapon. Um, or computer servers, you know, something that we would assess vulnerability for cyber attack. So each of these sections is ranked then on a 20-point scale, and at the end of the assessment, there'll be a final score and a general determination of the vulnerability of the place, the organization, or the event. And then from there, the person could look at covering the most vulnerable areas to increase their security, or it's a good tool to use to start a conversation with law enforcement to, to try to help them handle these vulnerabilities and, and harden. So the vulnerability assessment tool, will people be able to maybe use that before they come to the workshop or is this something they're, they're going to get at the workshop? Oh, they can have it uh, before. I'll certainly make that available. It's also in my book. It's online as well. Um, so it would be helpful if they had it and kind of look through before mm-hmm. we started the assessment Uh, But if not, it's very thought-provoking, and if they haven't looked at it before and the first time they see it is during this assessment, that's still useful. Well, I think the, you know, anytime you work for a a company or an organization or, you know, a a church or a business, uh, whatever it may be, um, identifying vulnerabilities is is the way that you're going to be safer. And I think if you have a tool that you're going to be able to get at this seminar on November 12th, you know, you're going to walk away much better than you were when you before you came to the workshop because you're going to learn about how to identify these vulnerabilities. And, you know, sometimes it's after the fact that if there's an event, security is always looked at as to, well, why did, why did this happen? And, you know, we learn something from every single event that happens um, in this country, whether it's a mass casualty attack, maybe whether it's a, a, a bomb, a pipe bomb or anything like that. We always learn a lot after the fact. So I think, Jenny, your book and your the vulnerability assessment tool is very proactive because it's, it's, it's working to get in front of, of an event that could happen. So basically what you're doing is you're providing much more protection for your business or church or school or potentially even, even your home. Can someone use something like this at, at, at their home? Definitely, yes. Uh, there are questions on the assessment tool that that also applied to our homes. And, you know, it's interesting because we do we do take active measures at our homes to have security systems or, you know, possibly have a, a personal protection, things like that. But then when we leave our homes and we go out into the world, which we have to every day, all day we visit soft targets 
uh, whether it's churches, schools, places we work. Um, so we leave the security of our home and go out into the world. So it definitely can cross-apply um, some of the things that we use to harden public facilities um, to our own homes. Yeah, in terms of soft targets, and I know, Jenny, you said at the at the beginning of your presentation, you're going to identify soft targets and soft target hardening, which I think is, is important. Uh, some people may not know what that is all about. But my question would be a, a soft target, let's say, for example, a restaurant um, or a movie theater. What can be done to harden, harden a soft target? Because the businesses really depend on people coming to them. So is there a line that you can cross between hardening a soft target too much? Well, that's a really good question. And I certainly get pushback when I go out and work with the for-profit, let's say, shopping centers, places like that, because they don't want to look like a fortress. They want to be an attractive venue. They want people to come shop there and not be repelled by ugly security measures, I guess, if you will. One of the things that I found living in the Middle East is that security doesn't have to be ugly. Um, for instance, if they had bollards protecting a front entrance, they would be planters, you know, or they'd be beautiful works of art, fountains, things like that. So I try to, I think people sometimes think security and they think ugly, you know, yeah. immediately it's going to be like a fortress. Um, so there are ways to protect, even without customers knowing what what's happening around them, that they're being protected. It doesn't have to be so blatant nowadays with different types of technology. Um, but I think that security draws people in now. I mean, we all make decisions about where we're going to go or, or our children are going to go to college, for instance. I mean, we all make decisions based on security. If we don't feel secure at a mall, if there's been shootings or they have a history of gangs or things like that, we're not going to shop there. Right. Um, and with so many malls in a, in a city, we don't have to shop there. Um, or our child's not going to go to a college that has uh, a lot of violent issues. So we are making these decisions every day, whether it's conscious or subconscious. We're sizing up a place and we're deciding whether it's safe to go there. So what I try to tell for-profit venues is that security is actually going to draw people in now. They want to know that there's security in an event. If there's a, a Fourth of July parade, you know, they want to read about the parade and read that there, there'll be bag checks or we'd like to thank the local police department in advance for providing security. Or, and, the, you know, the bad guys, when they're looking for a target, they're out there reading this stuff as well. And so we're repelling them with this language. But at the same time, we're also drawing people in because they know that they'll be safe and protected. Um, so I, I think there is a fine line. However, um, I, I would like people to know that security actually draws in customers and doesn't repel customers these days. People want security. They want to feel safe. That's a great, that's a really great point. Jenny, can you provide our listeners some examples of, of recent emergent threats and how people are being affected by these threats psychologically? Because I would think that there has to be some type of a psychological impact when these events keep occurring or events that haven't happened yet um, are are potentially in the works. How does that affect people psychologically? Well, I, I think security fatigue is definitely an issue in our country. I think a lot of people are just tired of the whole issue of um, shootings and active shooters and things like that. Um, and I think, you know, if you think about see something, say something, it only works if people are engaged in the fight. You know, if there are force multipliers, our eyes and ears out there. So if they stop looking or they stop caring, or they just think somebody else is taking care of it, you can see how that would add to the vulnerability. Um, but another dangerous mindset is denial. So if you consider that the widely accepted definition of a mass shooting is at least four people injured or killed in a shooting, not including the perpetrator. According to online trackers, as of October 1st, there were 325 mass shootings in the U.S. this year with 363 killed and over 1,300 injured. So by that formula, the, the widely accepted formula, we have at least one mass shooting a day in our country. Mm. But now there's a movement to change the definition of a mass shooting to raise the number of injured and dead. To me, this is clearly a sign of denial of, of what's really an epidemic or pandemic in our country. You know, perhaps changing the definition will lower the numbers and just make us all feel better. Right. Um, Denial is really manifesting itself around these these types of issues. Um, and, and also, I find people who just don't think bad things are going to happen to them or at their facility. You know, it's a very dangerous mentality, especially when you think of insider threat. Um, someone who has access to a facility, they know the vulnerabilities, 
they can violently act at the time and place of, of their choosing. Um, so I always tell people to beware of Nemo, not in my organization mentality mm-hmm. that I see. I just want to kind of take your points about, you know, the people, the changing the definition of a, of a, of a mass casualty uh, attack. I mean, sometimes these things just happen too frequently where people are really, you know, not, they don't feel good. I mean, from a psychological perspective, it's just people are on, on edge. They see this happening and they think it's inevitable. If you change the definition of, of mass shooting, psychologically, you mentioned, you, you touched upon this, psychologically, is, 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 is it okay to make people feel better? Well, I don't think so because, you know, security is, uh, it's tough. It's really a marathon. I mean, we really have to stay engaged we can't just back off because it provides the bad actors a lot more access. I mean, if we stop, if we don't have the heat on and we don't think that there's a problem, then they can pretty much move about at will. And so that's the, the problem. Um, just what I see is a growing number of people who have either no awareness of the threat, mm-hmm. they're not mentally prepared that it could happen to them or in their facility, and, and how that manifests itself then is no sense of determination to engage when something bad happens. Uh, we're seeing it even just with things that are happening on the street. For instance, there was a video yesterday of a woman who was stabbed in England, and people are just standing around. They're not engaging. They're, they're filming it on their phones, but they're not actually engaging. It's almost like it's not happening. It's surreal. I think it increases our vulnerability to have people who are detached from what's happening, but it also makes the environment more permissible for bad actors. And like I said, the fight for security is a marathon and it's exhausting, but giving up and just accepting that this is our new normal is really isn't an option. Right. Yeah. That's, you said it perfectly. It's not a, it's not a, um, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon in terms of, of, of security and protecting ourselves. So, Jenny, what would you say to the average person, or how can the average person change their thought processes to be less vulnerable and susceptible to future attacks? Well, to lessen their own vulnerability, I think they just need to take some simple actions. Um, the first would just be preparation in case something bad happens. And it, it's simple as just finding a nearest exit as soon as you enter a restaurant or a theater uh, or when you check into a hotel. And, and actually in a hotel, testing out the exit, make sure that the door opens. We've had some cases in the past where the door was either barricaded by the shooter, such as in the Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech attack, um, or emergency exit doors aren't working, locked or blocked. You know, people shouldn't assume that everything works, that everything's going to work in their favor. Um, and also to have a backup plan. There's research showing that in an emergency, people naturally head back to the same door that they entered through. And one example was the devastating fire at the concert in 2003 up in Rhode Island, which killed 100 mm-hmm. people. Right. People actually passed emergency exits and windows to get back to the front door where they entered. Um, and due to the panicked crowd, they were pressing and they were trapped. And many actually died in that entrance vestibule. So you have to think through your escape plan. Mm-hmm. And really, it's just become second nature. I mean, for someone like me who was in the military for 21 years and then worked in counterterrorism field, I've always felt like I'm a target and my family's a target. Um, I know it's hard for an average person to wrap their mind around that. Um, but really over time, it just becomes second nature to walk in, figure out where the exit is, have some kind of a plan. It really takes no time at all. Um, the second thing would be if you hear gunfire, what you think is gunfire, you need to act. You know, seconds count in, mm-hmm. in an attack. If you think that most attacks are over within minutes, um, so really it's the difference between life and death to immediately put distance or a barricade between themselves and the possible shooter. And it's natural for the mind in these cases to try and resolve what they're hearing. You know, is it fireworks? You hear Mm -hmm. people say that over and over, even in a place where there wouldn't be fireworks like a church. Um, But the mind goes to these places, you know, how can it be happening? Why is this happening to me? But you need to act immediately without hesitation, you know, better safe than sorry. So the final thing would just be be aware of people in the surroundings. My daughter studies and lives abroad, and we've had this conversation about trusting her gut instinct. And Mm -hmm. she actually got off the train a few stops early um, once because she felt like something was wrong or there was some kind of imminent danger. And really, humans are outstanding sensors. One of our most underappreciated natural gifts is intuition, just the ability to know something from instinct. Um, rather than proof of evidence or, or conscious reasoning. People are constantly observing and scanning the environment, whether they realize it or not. 
um, and they're compiling this knowledge and they're based on their experience. All this leads to intuition, and intuition taps all these little subconscious bits and pieces. Um, so we really should trust it. Uh, well, if we think something's wrong, if we think someone's out of place or their activities are unusual or suspicious, we really need to trust our intuition and our instinct and take some action. Always trust your gut. You know, that's, that's, yeah. I agree with you 100%. You know, one thing I, I've, I've told this story when I've gone out and, and, and done speaking presentations that, you know, when my kids were young and, and I would take them to the, uh, like, say, the movie theater, um, I'm, Jenny, probably a lot like you, I'm kind of, I'm kind of wired this way, you know, with always security <laughs> in my mind. And I, I would ask my, my son, I would say, you know, um, if something were to, bad were to happen right now, where, where would you go? Where, you know, where, where's the nearest exit? And, you know, always try to have that conversation with him. Of course, he turned to me and say, you know, shut up, Dad. I'm trying to eat my popcorn or I'm trying to watch the previews <laughs> or something like that. Um, but the, what it did was it, 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 it instilled that in their mind, you know, and I try to do that a lot when, when my kids were small because I would, that's just how I'm thinking and I want them to be able to think the same way. So I, I certainly understand what you're saying about people should be really taking uh, um, account of, of, of where they're at. And, and if something bad were to happen, what would they do? You know, it, it, mm-hmm. you, made the, you made a great point um, with that. And Jenny, I want to thank you for taking time to come on the Homeland Security Training Institute podcast uh, this week. And we greatly look forward to your appearance and your presentation here. So remember, the Homeland Security Training Institute live free seminar is going to be held here at the college on Tuesday, November 12th. It's a free event, and the topic is soft target hardening from theory to practice. You'll need to go to Eventbrite on the internet and register to get a free ticket so you can attend. So I tell people, do that as soon as possible. The event is going to be from 9 a.m. to 12.30 p.m., and it will take place in the Student Resource Center, room 2000. And there'll be information on Eventbrite as to the location of the Student Resource Center. It's known as SRC 2000 here at the college. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for having me today, and I'm excited to see everybody at the event on November 12th. Fantastic. And that's our podcast for this week. Thank you for tuning in, and uh, we have more great shows uh, lined up for you here in the near future. So until next time, take care, and we'll see you later. 